Today on Quest, Dr. Amber Salvador gives us a crash course on psychology. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective, with cases that ranged from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, and I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know, and there's still so much we don't know. For me, curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Today, my interview is with Dr. Amber Salvador. She is a clinical psychologist. And I wanted to let my listeners who aren't familiar with psychology learn a little about the basics of what a psychologist does and the services they can perform. And hopefully this will help lessen the stigma around mental health a little more. I learned a lot today, and I hope you will too. Enjoy the interview. Welcome to Quest. Today, my guest is Dr. Amber Salvador. She is a clinical psychologist, transformational coach. She's been featured in numerous health and news articles in the mental health field. She's been called on as an expert to interview on ABC and Fox. She is also the creator of the Mind, Body, Soul Masterclass and is best known for her abilities to help people break unconscious patterns that are holding them back from a life of fulfillment and love, health, and purpose. Welcome to the show, Amber. Hi. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate it. It's great to have you on the show. I haven't had a psychologist on the podcast yet, so I have a lot of of questions, lots of questions. (laughs) But yeah. let's first, let's start kind of like tell our listeners a little about you. Where did, your, where did you get your education? Where are you at in this world? Like, tell, tell everyone a little bit more about you. Yeah, I'm happy to. Well, hello, everybody. i um, happy to be the first psychologist on the podcast. That's awesome. Um, I've been passionate about psychology since birth. You know, you know how some people's minds are oriented towards business or adventure or, or whatever it might be, family, my mind has always been fascinated with human behavior. And as a little girl, I found myself reading books and writing and thinking and singing and even dancing from a place of curiosity and why do people do what they do? And I've just always sought to understand um, and to feel. And so um, psychology just became a natural fit for me because my mind, I was already oriented to that from a very early age. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so I went, I I basically, I went to school up in Oregon. I went to Oregon State, go Beavs. 
And then I took four years off after college to really just like discover what was for me. And I found that I just had this calling, this deeper feeling, this knowing that I talked to a lot of my clients and just in general about really trusting this inner voice that you have, your yeah. soul, your guidance. And I had this knowing that the field of psychology was calling me, but in order to do that, back then my understanding was you had to go to grad school mm. and mm. i was avoiding that for a long time because i really love being a student i love being uh, in school but to get your doctorate that is seven years of blood sweat and tears yeah so, uh, <laughs> yeah it's no joke it's no joke so, uh, but I eventually did it because I just felt like this calling inside me. So I actually went to a private school up in Orange County because I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I want to be by the beach. That was like my biggest prerequisite is I got to be right. by the beach. So, <laughs> right? Doesn't that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So I went to school up in Southern California and then I moved to San Diego and did an internship and a postdoctoral fellowship down here at this very well-known uh hospital down here in San Diego and I've been here ever since because I'm in love with the sun and the beaches and and the clients I have lots of clients and lots of good experience down here <laughs> well I don't blame you the, the the ocean's always calling me too so I totally oh, understand where you're coming from you're gonna dive yeah. into especially with a school commitment like that for oh, seven yeah. years you might as well do it in a beautiful climate and not the Pacific Northwest, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a non-negotiable. Like if I'm going to do this, I'm going to be where I want to be. So exactly. So, so, so you use a lot of different modalities in your practice. Yeah. So some of these are cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, mindfulness, core beliefs, yeah. uh, breath work, holistic healing. Yeah. So for people listening that are new to therapies such as these, I want to discuss these a little. Yeah, of course. So let's kind of go through the basics of what like cognitive behavioral therapy is. That's, is that probably the most common thing that a psychologist uses? So there are hundreds of different types of therapies that a therapist, a psychologist can use. And really it depends on the individual therapist or psychologist based on what they gravitate towards. So sure. in my schooling, I was classically trained in more psychodynamic, think Freudian theory. Sure. Um, I was more trained there, but what I found was cognitive behavioral therapy is the number one evidence-based therapy for treatment of major mental health issues, such as major depression, anxiety disorders, panic attacks, uh, bipolar disorder, things like this. So in the, in the work that I was doing, I wanted to learn more evidence-based therapies because I found I want to help people get results and I want them to get results more quickly than more traditional psychoanalysis, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that really is more of years and years and twice a week and on the couch. And that's just a different style. And there's some therapists who still do that today and that works for them. I wanted more evidence-based skills um, that I could use to help my clients get results and get them more quickly. Sure, sure. Now, does, does CBT address um, behaviors and thought patterns? And, and do they, does it do that in like the present time rather than like analyzing the past? Or is there a difference? Is... Yeah, absolutely. So we, we look at the past to inform the present. Okay. So we are, our brain is like a computer and it, it gets programmed from birth and your brain and your mind is programmed with different thought patterns, different belief patterns, different emotional patterns, ways like habits that you have. A lot of these things are largely unconscious, meaning we're not aware of it. And it was all programmed in childhood or early adolescence. And so CBT was what we can call it. Cognitive behavioral therapy really focuses on changing thoughts, distorted thoughts, thoughts that you're holding, beliefs that you're holding. And that's more schema therapy, which is core belief stuff, but really working to shift 
unhelpful, distorted thinking patterns that we adopted because of how we grew up or what we experienced. And then also to change dysfunctional habits and behaviors that are keeping us stuck, that are creating painful emotions over and over and over again. So that's the emphasis with CBT is those two areas, you're correct. What happens in a typical CBT session? Um, well, if we're just focusing on CBT, we're going to be looking at, so I use a lot of dialectical behavior therapy too, which is more behaviorally based, but mm -hmm. basically, believe it or not, it's easier to change what you do than to change how you think. Interesting. Research shows that if you wanted to change a core belief, which is a core, a core belief is just a rooted belief that you have about yourself, about the world about other people. Do I trust people? Do I not? Am I a successful person? Am I a failure? It's kind of this deeper rooted belief that we all have. And uh, CBT helps to shift and change those beliefs as well as change behaviors. And in a session, I would start with behaviors first because it takes about nine months, research shows, to change a core belief. I, I don't know. I actually think it could take longer. I think there are people who are struggling with beliefs their entire life. Um, but it's really just how you respond to that belief. Not that it fully ever goes away, which they can, but some beliefs are so deeply rooted that it's just how you respond to them over time versus getting really attached to them, believing them and getting really emotionally upset. Right. So, yeah. Now, now, you've talked about dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. Yeah. So yeah. let's talk about just in a nutshell how this is different from cognitive behavioral therapy. It's a type of that, right? Is that yes. accurate to say? Yes, okay. absolutely. So CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is going to be more if you, it's really good for folks who are suffering with depression and anxiety. This would be, you know, panic attacks, you have trouble leaving your home. Um, you're noticing you're just dysphoric day to day, or you're majorly depressed. Um, and also, by the way, it's really good for people in general who don't have severe mental health issues. I know these treatments are for mental health, but we all have mental health and we all have distorted thinking and we all have bad days and bad habits. <laughs> yeah. It's a relative term, but you know what I mean? There's something that right. doesn't feel good for you. Right. Um, sure. DBT is a specialized offshoot of CBT and it's like a it's like a third wave therapy where what that means is it's focused specifically on treating folks that suffer with emotion dysregulation. So what that means is that some of us were born, you know how they say oh cancer can run in your family or uh, thinning hair can run in your family. Right. Um, Emotion dysregulation can run in the family, meaning that some of us are born with a predisposition to being really emotionally sensitive, to having really intense emotional experiences. So, so like the average person might feel upset at a five and someone with emotion dysregulation, they feel that same issue at a 10. So they feel very emotionally upset and then their emotions last longer. So this treatment is for someone who struggles with emotion dysregulation, who has trouble in relationships, who has trouble knowing who they are, and who definitely copes in ways that are very effective. And I see. BBT teaches a lot of skills. It's really about mindfulness and being present to what you're doing and why you're doing it and then consciously making choices to change it. So for just the average person, instead of sitting each night and mindlessly eating cookies or having that third glass of wine just because you do it, it's getting really intentional to what's actually underneath this? Why do I every night eat these cookies or drink this wine? Is there something that I'm trying to numb, to avoid, to medicate? And you kind of get to that and you learn skills to do something different. Sure. Really. Yeah. Where does, so I want to kind of run some of these things by you and tell me kind of where they fit or how you would handle them. 
So yeah. you mentioned that with CBT, that is for panic, phobias, anxiety. Where does depression and substance abuse fit into this? Would that also be covered under CBT or is this a specialized therapy? Depression can be really good for CBT as well. Um, yeah, I was saying depression and anxiety for CBT. And in DBT, a lot of folks definitely have depression and anxiety as well. Um, but for dialectical behavior therapy, that would actually be better for addictions um, okay. because it's really trying to uh, become really aware of what is the function of your addiction because you need to understand like what's it doing for you essentially and and why at the same time that it's doing something for you how is it also severely harming you and that's kind of the the hallmark of an addiction is that it starts impairing you but you keep doing it right, right. So those skills, that mindfulness, uh, DBT can be really more effective for uh, recovery and addiction type issues. And what about like borderline personality disorders or suicidal behaviors? That's DBT. Yeah, okay. that's actually, that therapy is designed for more folks that suffer with personality disorders, which is interesting, Todd. A lot of people don't even know what that means. Um, they didn't even know that that's a thing. Uh, but we can actually have personality disorders, which the field of psychology is very cautious about diagnosing that because that for people can become a label like narcissism and histrionic sure. and antisocial. Um, but it essentially means that the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you interact in the world is very heavily influenced by probably a toxic environment that you grew up in or a lot of instability or chaos or unpredictability. And as a result, it has permeated your personality and it has affected the way that you do life in, to your detriment to some degree. So folks sometimes have trouble holding jobs or romantic relationships or taking care of themselves because they're basically living out the patterns of their past in a really right. way. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. Let's yeah. move on to, to like core beliefs and to talk a little bit more about these core beliefs and these schemas. Yeah. Give, give me a description of how, how would you define this? Yeah. So I do this in my masterclass actually, where I really dive deep. I have my clients do exercises around understanding and I use the example of a tree. So if you think about, the roots of the tree is obviously what's giving life to the tree. It's in the soil, but the roots are like a core belief. And what that basically means is growing up, you had experiences where you grew up, what city, what country, what religion or no religion you had, were you poor, were you rich, were you middle class, were you fat, were you thin, were you teased, were you privileged? We all have experiences. All of those experiences create a story for a child. A child begins to say, wow, this is who I am based on what I experience, which makes sense if you think of it, right? It's like, yeah. We build our identity off of what we experienced. Did my, did my parents attend to me? Did they listen to me? Were they at work all the time? Did they hit me? Did they love me? What, whatever it was. So we as children create stories about who we are. We create stories about who other people are. Are they safe? Are they trustworthy? Am I smart? Am I stupid? Am I really good at things? Do I kind of fail a lot? And then we create stories about the world. Is the world safe? Is the world dangerous? Um, you know, and so those stories become beliefs. And then we start building an identity around those beliefs. And that's like the roots of the tree. And then there's other facets of that. We have conditional beliefs. We have thoughts. We have emotional patterns. We have behaviors. And so part of what I help people do is it's like an identity framework where if you're stuck in something as an adult, whether it's a job you hate or relationships don't work out for you, or you're chronically full of anxiety, or you feel depressed more often than you'd like, we do that framework and we look at 
what is it? Like, what are some of the patterns that you've created unknowingly because of what you went through growing up? And how has that formed your identity and who you show up in the world as today? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right. So are we consciously aware of our core beliefs? Usually no. Okay. No. In, in personal development world, they're called limiting beliefs. It's the same thing. But gotcha. um, there's, there's a lot more to it. And I call it psychology land. Um, there's <laughs> a lot more there's more of an in-depth framework around it. And um, it's, it's more like schema therapy is what it's called, but it, it really looks at, you can have lots of different core beliefs um, and you can have positive core beliefs, you can have negative core beliefs. So some very common ones that people struggle with. And actually Tony Robbins talks about this. So I'll just, so many people love him and know him. Um, Tony really says, you know, all of us want to know that we are that we that we matter and that we're good at something and all of us fear that we're not good enough at something it's like we're not pretty enough we're not smart enough we're not fit enough we're not ambitious enough right so all of us fear on some level we're not enough which is a core belief i'm not enough or i'm not good enough and then if we're not enough then the ultimate fear is we won't be loved and that's another core belief. I'm unlovable. I don't matter. I'm not worthy. And if we believe that, and many of us, millions of people are running around as adults believing these lies about themselves, like pretty much all of us on some level struggle with believing that we're enough in one or 50 areas of our life. And so Tony says, if if you don't think you'll be loved, then you're afraid you will die because love is about survival. We are wired for connection. So if right. we don't feel loved, we think we won't survive. And that's not conscious, Todd. That's, that's very unconscious. However, for people who are in constant distress, it's probably more conscious for them. They're more aware that they are afraid of that. So, so maybe these are just activated as we grow up. Is that what you're saying really? Yes, like situation. something something seems out of sync in a situation that it's activating that core belief system. Yeah, it's usually losses, perceived losses. So gotcha. you lose a job. So, so the two biggest reasons that I usually that clients usually come to me is they've lost a job or they've lost a relationship. Um, or they're not happy with themselves, right? They're stuck in habits, they know it you know, we're smart as human beings, most of us, like we have an understanding of what we're doing and like that it's not good for us on some level. It's just, we can't get out of it. We can't, we've tried all these things and we can't make it stop. And so um, all of this calls forth that deeper core belief. And the way that you can know you hit a core belief, Todd, is the more intense your reaction emotionally, so the angrier you get, the more scared you get, the more ashamed you feel, typically that's how you know you've probably hit on a deeper rooted belief there. Yeah, and, and, and in a therapy session, you can, you can really get people to witness what's happening when they experience these things. You're going to kind of tell people what these cycles are, what these beliefs are, and maybe articulate it to them what they're experiencing yeah. And, and I guess in some way you can get them to kind of rewrite what those rules are. Would you say that's, that's accurate to say? So that would make me think you can also manufacture new core beliefs as you grow. They're not just necessarily instilled in you from childhood. I could, as oh. a 50 year old man, I can still be making my own core beliefs and shifting these beliefs and modifying them as I need to. Yes, 100%. That's why we have what's called neuroplasticity, where our brain can create new neuronal connections and so part of what we're doing with CBT, DBT, mindfulness, um, what we're doing is we're trying to lessen a neuronal connection in your brain that keeps you doing a behavior or having a thought pattern that's unhelpful to you or that's harming you. And so we bring, this is, this is part of the power of therapy and coaching is you bring a 
awareness that you did not have. You bring the unconscious into the conscious and you become aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And then, then we do work and a lot of it is emotional work. It's not just shifting thoughts, which it is that that's called cognitive restructuring where we're literally saying, like you just said, Todd, here we have this old belief. How would you like to think about yourself? Because you're the creator of your life. You get to decide what your narrative is. And if you have a narrative based on the past that isn't working for you anymore, it worked at one point, but it doesn't work anymore, then we can shift it to a new narrative. But that's not that simple. There's a lot of emotional and practical things we have to do to shift it and keep it, um, keep it going, basically, to, to sure. enrich that connection. Sure, sure. And, and, and I think, so one of the other uh, uh, modalities of your therapies is you do mindfulness and breath work and holistic practices. Let's kind of talk about those. I think yeah. a lot of people think in terms of mindfulness as meditations and breathing techniques and things like this. Tell me what you do with these things. Yeah, so very good. One thing that I've learned, so I obviously, I was trained in these evidence-based approaches. So I have that, that part of my skill set. But then in 2015, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune illness. And that has set the course for not only my learning of holistic healing, holistic means natural. So like natural healing and also learning very deeply and intimately about the mind body connection, which is basically I had this illness and I was told take steroids and get your spleen out. And that, that might help you. And I was thinking, take an organ out and it might help me. I did the research and it was like, oh, you have a 40% chance of it helping. And I was like, there's gotta be another way. And sure enough, there is, if you're open to another way. And so what that did is it sent me on this journey of, I was healthy for so long. And then suddenly at the age of 34, I get diagnosed with this chronic life-threatening autoimmune disorder. And I was like, how, how did that happen? Like what happened here? And when I started looking at all the factors and that's really why I like holistic medicine and naturopathic practices, because it looks at the whole human. And unfortunately, a lot of times in Western medicine, and I'm sure your listeners have had this experience, we look at parts of the human, right? Right. We look at the whole person. And the thing is, the whole person is interacting together. So my mood and what I think directly affects how my body feels. And you know that's true because sometimes for some of you, when you get stressed out, you get a headache or you get nauseous or you have this unexplained right. back pain, even though you never had a back injury. So your body will communicate to you what's going on whether you mentally and emotionally are aware of it and again that's the power of the unconscious is there's if you think of like an iceberg there's so much underneath the water there's so much going on with us in our internal world mentally emotionally um, psychologically that so many of us are unaware of but it's all affecting our bodies and so that's where i really started investing in how do I release some of this emotional energy that's in my body? Because we can work on the thoughts and we can change your behaviors. But the truth is, until you start learning how to regulate your nervous system, which is also a major part of your mental health, is your nervous system. Because it's the thing that's in control of your fight or flight. Until you learn how to regulate that, you're always going to be tense and wired and anxious and burning out your adrenals. And America has totally conditioned all of us to be busy bodies who are on high stress and our nervous systems are fried. Right. 
So, so it, it really, you know, I started learning how do you interact with the body to release emotional distress from the body because we store our emotions in the body, in our tissues, in our organs, in our cells, we store it in our body. So that's also why some people will do therapy and not get the results they want because they have trauma stored in their body. Right. So that's another piece is learning how, so through breath work, breath work is so underrated and so beautiful because it helps you to literally, it conditions your nervous system, different types of breath work um, practices. And it trains your body to calm and relax, which is the only place that you can actually heal is when you're in parasympathetic, when you're relaxed, your body cannot heal when you're in fight or flight. And so many of us are just in fight or flight all day and we don't even realize it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I started doing things like changing my diet. Um, I, I've done so many things. I don't know if you want to hear all of them, <laughs> but <laughs> I've done a million things that were more body based. Um, have you ever heard of spinal like network chiropractic? No. What is that? Yeah. So I've been doing that too. It's, it's the idea that we store trauma and we store emotional residue in our spines. I mean, we store it all over, but we also yeah. store it in our spine. And so it can mess with our alignment. And so it's, it feels like magic when you're doing it with a practitioner who's really good, but basically they're, they're touching your spine and they're helping you to release, um, emotional energy. And so some people might think this is wild, but release emotional energy that's trapped in your body. And so that helps to just get rid of some of this stuff that you're feeling. And, and then a lot of the work that I do with my clients is a lot of guided imagery of going back into memories and having them either do things differently, work with their inner child, um, you know, communicating to themselves from a space of compassion and nurturance, which a lot of us have this inner critic. Uh, so I do a lot of like getting into the body, breathing into the body, imagery around being present with what is and helping people to release emotions from the body essentially. That's great. Let's talk about mind, body, soul mastery. Yeah. And what you're doing with this. The yeah. first question I want, so I want to get into this, what you, what you're doing with these classes and how you, what you, how you've built up this little uh, franchise that you're doing here. But I, the first question I want to ask you may seem trivial, but I always, I always get different answers from people on this. Mm -hmm. The distinction between mind, body, soul versus just mind, body and the mm -hmm. order in which they're in, I always hear people talk about, no, it's body, mind, soul. It's mind, body, soul. It's soul, mind, body. And it's, it seems, it's very weird to talk about, do you know what I mean though? Like a lot of yeah. people put these things, they order them differently. And some people yeah. don't think of it uh, as kind of a trinity like that of mind, body, and soul. And it's just mind, body. You know, yeah. you, tell, tell me why you have yours the way it is. Yeah, this is, um, this is really a reflection of my journey, which if it's my journey, it's your journey. Because sure. we're, in my belief, we're all just one. And we're all just living out different variations, different human experiences. But we're all connected through the same source, which I call God. Some people call it universe, nature, whatever. Sure. Um, and the, the order doesn't really matter because to me, it, it might to some, the order doesn't matter because they're all interconnected. So sure. I'm, that was just the order that came to me and that was what felt right to me. But, it, but it's, not, it's not like a strategic way that I uh, work with people. Like first we do the mind, then we do the body, then we do the soul. Although I will say for my master class, I do it that way. I start with core beliefs. We really do a lot of practices around understanding the way your mind works, understanding why you do what you do based on your thinking. Then we shift into taking care of the body at a high level and how it impacts the mind and the, 
like how they impact each other. And then we go into more spiritual, soulful work. So I guess I do in my yeah. math class. Um, <laughs> I guess I have done that. Um, but I think that, you know, I think we're a body with a soul and our soul is the inner GPS system for our life's path. And so a lot of what, who we are today was conditioned and programmed into us from when we were young. It programmed our mind, which then programmed how our body shows up because what we think and what we believe impacts what we feel, impacts our body and how we treat our body, how we eat, how our, our lifestyle. And all of that impacts our access to our soul. So yeah. if, if that makes sense, right? So if I, so for example, for me, I grew up in a pretty unhealthy, somewhat toxic family environment. And so my programming was quite pessimistic, um, defeatist. I, I grew up pretty poor. So I was jealous a lot of other people because I saw these loving, connected families who went on trips. And I, would, I created this narrative of like, poor me, I don't have that. What's wrong with me that I have this kind of dysfunctional family? And that impacted my body. I ate a lot of fast food. Um, I drank a lot. You know, I was unhealthy with my sexual practices because I just wanted love, right? And yeah. that impacted how I connected with my soul because the more polluted we are with all that stuff, that we're just carrying in our body, the toxins, um, what we're eating, all of that numbs you out and it disconnects you from source. It disconnects you from the truth of who you are because you're just reenacting uh, dysfunctional and traumatic patterns. So one of the big things I do is called cycle breaking because that's me. I'm a cycle breaker. I, yeah. I realized I realized from an early age the dysfunction in my family but I didn't know how to change it. And it wasn't till I had some very life-changing experiences at different points of my life where I decided, okay, I need to upgrade my mind. I need to upgrade the way I treat my body. And as a result of that, I had more access to my soul, which was kind of like a side effect. And then I had more access to God. I had more access to my intuition. I had more knowing. And suddenly I was getting downloads, if you want to call it, information about here's your life path, go this way. But I wasn't able to hear that as well before because I was believing and acting out all this crap, basically. So yeah. uh, that's the purpose of Mind, Body, Soul is is getting healthy on all those levels so that you can do what you're meant to do here in this life. Cause your soul has the answers for you. I believe. Yeah. It, it's funny how much you're orbiting, like what my next book is going to be. Yeah. Only, what is only well, so my, I have a book out now um, that's, that's very popular and I'm working on, it's the long, slow run to the next book, which is still a couple of years out, but but yeah. it's, um, it is really, so my order is a little bit different. Mine starts yeah. with body, then mind, then soul, uh -huh. because yeah. I feel like you have to get your body in a, a, a perfect spot to really be able to get into the mental work and then really get into the work of the soul. So oh. my approach is a little different, but we're, we're, we're orbiting each other in terms of our ideas. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. I love it. So let's talk about your master, your master program that you have. Let's talk about that. So it is mind, body, soul, mastery, mm -hmm. and it is a... It is eight. We is it? It's a course, right? So I have a couple different offerings, and it really depends on what the client needs. So one thing I'll do is, and I'll offer that here for any of your listeners who feel called or connected to talk to me. I will offer a complimentary call for people um, to see if if what they're going through or, or where they want to go is in the line with how I could help them. But basically, uh, what I do is once I assess your needs, I do have a course. It's an eight week course and that's the mind, body, soul masterclass. 
And I do other workshops. I just did a love leadership workshop. I'm going to do a cycle breaking workshop, but the, the course is eight weeks. And like I said, it's an emphasis on basically fine tuning yourself mentally, physically, soulfully, so that you can onboard healthy practices to be kind of the best and fittest version of yourself. Yeah. And then for people who want like, cause that's a group, that's a group. So if people who want more one-on-one, -on -one, I do work with people for six months or 12 months and we go deeper. Basically I, I do a treatment plan. We individualize like what you're going through and what you need. And then I have lots of tools in my toolbox to help you to work through these core beliefs, to understand why you're stuck in these habits, to upgrade yourself mentally, emotionally, and to really tap into like, why are you here? What's your purpose? And you know, why do you keep having these particular issues over and over? And, and we break those patterns for you. Now, are so, these, are these, I didn't mean to, to cut you off, but are these Zoom classes? Do people have to go to California to participate in this? Or how does, how does this work? No, so it's all through Zoom, right? I have a private practice here in San Diego, but because of COVID, everything's online right now. Sure. And I've actually really enjoyed that because everything that I can do with you in person, I can do through Zoom. It's become quite a comfortable space for me. Um, and my clients do fantastic with it. They're, they're getting like the same results, if not better, because people who are coming to me now are really ready to change. And that's what actually matters is, are you ready to make a change? Because I am a mirror and I'm going to hold it up for you. Um, right. So yeah, we do it on Zoom. So I have clients in New York and I have clients in Colorado and different spaces. And the class is also through Zoom, but it's live and it's interactive. And so, um, yeah, it's both. It's, it's totally me and you for that hour. And then there's other offerings depending upon what the client needs. And I have a lot of different ways for us to interact and for people to get results that they're looking for in quicker amount of time um, by my different offerings. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to have you as a guest was because I really like your approach uh, to psychology. And you and you and here, even with mind, body, soul, you still bring in a spiritual element to this, which I really like, which is always what my Quest Podcast orbits is spirituality and science yeah. and merging. Because I've always been so uh, disillusioned with people in the medical community, a scientific community, wanting to just prove away God, prove away the soul. Like if they could, there's a way in which they could prove this out of existence that would happen. Many people feel that way. Totally. And I, I'm, so I'm curious. And I, I feel like if I ask 10 psychologists the same question, it, who knows what the percentage would be, but, but can religion or spirituality and psychology coexist or should they? Yeah, a hundred percent. I, I think we, and this is so interesting, and I see the world this way a bit. D uh, when we go from children to adolescence to adulthood, developmentally, we, we develop cognitively. And part of the developmental process is where we shift from all or nothing thinking. And all or nothing is basically it's this or it's that. It's right or it's wrong. It's good or it's bad. And a lot of our society still functions in that all or nothing place where it's like, uh, you know, if you're religious, then you should just rely on God and you shouldn't rely on something that's not faith based or vice versa. Like, it, you know, if you're, you're not going to get the results that you want, if you just rely on prayer alone, you need to go to a, a practitioner. And the truth is, I think there's truth in all of it. And that's, um, developmentally, that's a higher skill set. It's, it, it's what I think we're all evolving towards, which is to be able to see the truth in all levels and to see that that person that you think is so wrong about something and you're trying to prove wrong, whether it's a political issue or a medical issue, um, from where they stand on their podium, it's right for them because developmentally, that's where they're at right now. So for the person who feels like I can only use prayer, I cannot do these other things. Well, that's their reality. That's what they're choosing to create. Um, and what I offer is there's more flexibility in our thinking where we can open our minds to say, in my opinion, uh, God created psychology. 
uh, God created science, God created sex, right? So yeah. all of these things are here for us to use to help each other. That's why there are psychologists and pastors and people, because the point is for all of us to serve each other and to help each other evolve. That's why we're here. And if you can see the truth in that or the goodness in that, then you can use all of it to help you to grow. That's kind of how I see it. You touched on something I was going to mention next. And uh, I was going to ask, you know, can religion or spirituality be a method for psychological care? Because I know, you know, in the religious community, people, they confess their sins, they pray, they ask for help from guardian angels or other sources. Yeah. Is that a method people can do or does it need to have a balance with seeking a real doctor in addition to that? Can someone get by with just using yeah, the religion as a way in which they can bring yeah. these things out? Yeah. That's Does that make question. sense? What I'm asking? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And there is no blanket statement for that because mm -hmm. I believe there are thousands upon millions of ways to heal there. I know people who are doing ayahuasca ceremonies to heal. And then I know people who take meds and do a very structured treatment plan in their healing. And I know people who are doing body work. And then some people are doing therapy. Some people are reading books. There's so many different ways to heal. There are more effective ways of healing, more uh, like quicker ways of healing, if you want to look at it that way. And so for the person who says, I rely on God or I rely on guardian angels, I'm, I'm not against that. I mean, I, <laughs> I am here today talking to you and having my own business and healing my body and have this wonderful love relationship because of my faith in God, because of praying to God. So I used my relationship with God as a, as a, to guide me. However, I didn't do that and that alone. And the reason I say that's important is because I think God can show us the way, but we are responsible to take the action. And I have a friend who she will pray and pray and pray, but she doesn't take the action. And therefore things aren't happening at the level that she wants them to happen. Things are happening, but they're not happening at the level. And it's because you have to co-create with God. You right. don't just rely on God to ch like do it for you. That's not the purpose of evolution, of, of evolving as a human being. That's not the purpose of why you're here. God, I believe God wants you to be an active participant in your own transformation. So absolutely. Yeah. Whether it's building a business or creating a love relationship or getting really healthy, you have to actively participate. So yes, you can pray, you can ask for help. Um, but the biggest thing is recognizing that the actual power is not outside of you, that, that you are, once you take a hundred percent responsibility for your life and you let God guide you, but you take responsibility, that's when you'll see real change. It's a, so I, I have, so that's great. Great answer. Yeah. I, love, I love hearing that from you. These last couple of questions I have are kind of uh, randomly different things I want to talk about. Yeah. Now, you're in California, which has a well-documented homeless problem. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that talk about the homeless issues in San Diego and Los Angeles as being issues of drugs. But there are a lot of people that talk about them being mental health issues, that mental health is actually maybe the underlying element of why there are so many homeless. Yeah. And where I want to go with this is a lot of people don't want to pay for therapy. And I, for many reasons, sometimes they can't afford it. They don't have the insurance for it. Certainly in the climate we live in now, people are really hurting for money and they have to make cuts. And yeah. the things that were optional, like dance classes for their kids or therapy for their husband or whatever it is, those things are being cut to be able to pay the mortgage. Yeah. So if this is happening and there's a stigma associated with therapy in some cases, yeah. Um, and I, and that could be because of many things, the anger or the sadness that people carry with them over their traumas that might come up in therapy that they may be embarrassed about it. it there isn't, it seems there's no real easy fix for this. And certainly as the environment changes around us, yeah. living in COVID and what that's 
done to affect people, COVID physically affecting people, COVID mentally affecting people that are quarantined. The results of this we might be seeing for the next three to five years totally. of what might happen. Right now we're at this place where people are getting evicted from their homes and their apartments because that kind of that moratorium of relaxing people paying bills is over. Yeah. I think we're about to see a big surge in these things. How yeah. do you address this when people need help and they can't get it for one reason or another? Well, there's a lot. I, I related a lot to what you just said there on a lot of different levels. Um, we have to start with whether you have money or resources or not, you will not seek help if you have uh, bias, prejudice around the concept of helping yourself mentally and emotionally. And our society definitely does, right? We all know that. Um, and the truth is all of us have some level of trauma, big T, big trauma, little T, little trauma. And little trauma can be something from being slightly bullied to being criticized by a parent who just never felt like anything was enough, to big trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, your whole house burned down, uh, a parent died when you were young, whatever it is. So all of us have these experiences and they affect all of us in adulthood, whether we realize it or not. And so this is going to be, I don't know how you're gonna think of this, but in my personal belief, I think COVID in part is here. It's 2020, it's the beginning of a new decade. And I think it's time for all of us to collectively evolve. And I think that COVID's purpose on a big scale, so I'm talking, when I talk about the soul, when I'm talking about spirituality on a bigger scale, I believe COVID is here to show us all our shit, so to speak. It's to help bring to the surface the things that people have been denying, avoiding, suppressing, not dealing with. And so that looks really ugly. A lot of times uh, when I work with my clients, I'll say sometimes, you know, it gets worse before it gets better. Sure. You know, because we have to, we have to dig, we have to look at things that you've been not looking at and that avoidance has actually been harming you because we're wired for pleasure. We don't like pain as human beings. Right. You know, and our society is a fast food culture where we're highly distracted and we want things that are flashy and pretty and entertaining. And if it takes a lot of work, we, some people will shy away from it, especially when it comes to the internal sides of us. And so we've been done a disservice by the way that we have looked at mental and emotional health to think that it means something bad about us, that we have trouble. And life is so complex, Todd, to think that we wouldn't have issues with our mood or how we think, or we wouldn't struggle with habits that don't serve us. Like that to me is nonsensical because it's yeah. so complex to be a human being. There's so much that's going on for all of us to juggle and handle that of course we need help with our mental and emotional health. Of course we need help with our bodies. Of course we need help with fixing our car and cooking and all the things that go on with a life. So it, it starts with people, uh, practitioners, so myself, people who use mental health services. It starts with all of us being more honest about it talking about it, sharing, not being ashamed, encouraging people to get help, making mental health a topic in the world that doesn't stop. Because until that happens, there will be thousands upon millions of people who potentially suffer or lose their lives because they have a block that I couldn't get help or it meant I was weak or it meant I was a failure. So that's yeah. the first part, right? Yeah. And then, and then the second thing is, um, and this is going to sound kind of harsh, um, but people don't have money until they do. And what I mean by that is that because there's a stigma on mental and emotional health, people are less apt to prioritize money towards that. 
Um, not all people, but people are less apt to prioritize money towards that. So looking at your daily habits, if you're someone who goes out to eat three to five times a week, let's just say, maybe not in COVID, right? All that money that's being used towards that, that money could be put towards helping yourself because right. we, we spend money on things that we prioritize. We, we, we spend money on things that matter to us. And a lot of us are unconsciously spending money on things that if we added it up, whether it's cigarettes or our trips to fast food or how much you eat out or video games or movies or whatever it is, if you add it up alcohol, you could have money to put towards like healing yourself. And that's right. why I say sometimes you have to reprioritize what matters to you. And it really starts with, do you see value in helping yourself mentally and emotionally? Is that important to you? Because not doing yeah. it, how's that impacting your life to not yeah. at this point? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, so first, so part one, yeah. beautiful words that yeah. you said, because that's why you're on the show is to yeah. lessen the stigma out there with people that listen, at least my listeners to yeah. hear and just how you're delivering this and how great, how great you can articulate this. Thank you. Um, also, I sort of subscribe to what you do, that COVID is here for a reason. Mm -hmm. And that if in a perfect world, hopefully this will take us to the next level where the humans could level up from this event. Totally. Personally, I'm a little bit more of a cup is half empty kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. don't have that much faith in humanity. <laughs> yeah. and, and secondly, I also look at it as this could be the beginning of another cycle on this planet that could be a really awful cycle, if yeah. especially, particularly from a biblical perspective. Yeah. But yeah. so I, so I, you know, I, obviously I want to be hopeful that people yeah. come out of this better, but if you watch the news, it seems the world gets worse every day. I know. And, uh, Remember that this is a biased form of reporting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's lots of, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough. I agree with you. I don't, I don't want to inject um, fear in anybody. I do think there's going to be a period of things getting worse before they get better. And yeah. I think there's a purpose for that. I think we're trying to be shaken up so that we change. Well, you know, I, what you're doing, like I said, there's a real parallel with what you're building with mind, body, soul, and kind of what I'm beginning to write about but mm -hmm. I really feel like we can't really fix the world until we fix ourselves. Yes. You know, if we can't fix the core of this problem, this place is going to go to shit. So, excuse me, like, but, yes. but it will. Yeah. So, you know, I want to bring up a kind of a flip side to um, the stigma of therapy in terms of how people are worried about what maybe is going to come out of them in therapy. But yeah. I want to talk about kind of the business side of therapy and something I maybe I want you to address because I think a lot yeah. of people are scared of, okay, if I go see Dr. Amber, I'm going to be hooked into going to see her 25 times an hour each week, this expensive yeah. bill, hundreds yeah. of dollars each week, and then she's going to prescribe something to me and then I'm going to come up with the money for the pharmaceuticals. I think people are terrified in that element of it that that the world of of uh, psychology has become such a big business that people are a little scared to go there. How would you address that from the business side? Yeah. Well, so one, just to clarify, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't prescribe meds. So I, that wouldn't be part of the protocol, <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. but, but um, how I would, how I would talk to you about that is that, you know, psychology like any other service like any other gift is an opportunity to change someone's life you know this is this is my calling this is my purpose i am very clear that i am put on the planet as a healer and as someone who can facilitate and give the tools and the support and the love and the guidance and, and the challenge so that people can change their lives and step into the life that they desire versus a life by default. Many of us are living a life by default where 
we're living, you know, we're doing what our mom and dad wanted us to do, or we're our circumstance dictated where we ended up or how we ended up. And millions of people are suffering because they're not actually tapping into why they're here and what they're really made of. And that's just a big thing called fear. Fear just like it rules people. And so part of my gifting is I had to walk the path. You know, my dad was homeless for quite a while and I, I dealt with all of that. I've had my own autoimmune stuff. I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I've walked the path of healing myself mentally, emotionally, physically, tapping into my soul. So I know the power of doing the work. And because of the work that I've done on myself and the work that I've done to educate myself to help serve people, I not only believe in it, but I believe it's worth every penny that I charge. And one thing that people don't often understand is that you can watch a YouTube video that's free and it will have like golden nuggets. It will have such good wisdom because you could go to school on YouTube, like everything's on YouTube. And you could get such good information, but you won't really implement it because it was this thing you listened to and you're like, yeah, that sounds good. And then you move on to the next thing. And then, and then you read a book and then you're like, yeah, that felt good in the moment. And then maybe you implement one thing, but you don't really implement very much. And suddenly you start collecting this story of, I do all these things and nothing works. And so what I have found is clients who invest in themselves who say, I'm going to invest in me, in my future, in my, my present self, and I'm going to do the work. Those are the people who get set free. And, right. and they make it a priority. I have changed, by all means, I should not be where I am. I should not be who I am, given how I grew up. But I invested in myself. I took risks. I did not give up on myself. And I said, I am worth more than that. And I'm going to live into what I'm actually here for. And it has changed my life. So I see all of this as a gift and I get to give that gift to other people if they're willing to invest in themselves and to say, you know what? I'm tired of believing I'm not worth it. I'm ready to make a change. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you think, so you mentioned a psychiatrist, um, with psychiatrists prescribe medications. Yeah. I yeah. once, many years ago, a psychiatrist told me that not in a session, just in out at lunch, you know, like yeah. that if someone was going to come in to see them, that they would go home with a prescription. Because if you, if you had the guts to show up at the psychiatrist's office and have that first session, they would go home with Prozac. You know, that was like the thing. So I'm wondering what this question is going is you're feeling on pharmaceuticals because these days I see a lot of people that get 15 minute evaluations. They go home with a prescription and they're told to come back in eight weeks to get a prescription to fight the side effects of that prescription and wind up with a second one. And are people over prescribed these days? Is this still a culture in the medical community to where prescriptions are the, the band-aid fix for things where like what you're doing is getting to the root of problems and hopefully yeah. eliminating the problems from their mind so that that's not even necessary, that you don't have to have a happy pill when you've gotten yeah. rid of the anger or sadness trauma that you might've held. What's yeah. your, what's your, what are your feelings on pharmaceuticals? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so I worked at a hospital, a psychiatric hospital for about seven years, seven or eight years, maybe nine. And part of our team included psychiatry. So all of our clients, all of our patients were on medications. And in regards to what I believe about medications, and this comes from ex like what I experienced, what I saw working in that uh, medical field for almost a decade. There's definitely a place for some medications for some people given certain types of disorders. So for example, if you have someone with bipolar disorder where they have bouts of episodes of mania or major depression and with bipolar disorder, I mean, major depression is debilitating. They cannot get out of bed. They cannot function. And the same is true for just major depression or even schizophrenia. 
You know, if someone's having active florid psychosis, this is where medications can be very, very helpful. It helps to just stabilize them so they can function, so they can do treatment. So what I mean by that is, I am absolutely not a proponent of people using medication to solve their problems because medication does not solve problems, it treats symptoms. So there are thousands, maybe millions of people on just medication every day, but they're not doing the work to understand why they have chronic anxiety or to understand why their mood dips. So for those people, if you're going to use a medication, which is sort of a larger intervention in my opinion, then I believe you need to be supplementing that with some therapy or coaching. Now, right. on the other side of that, I believe we're overprescribed as a society and a lot of people wanna point fingers at doctors about that, which I totally agree. But I think it's twofold and this may not be a popular opinion, but I think we also live in a society where a lot of people don't know how and don't frankly want to put in the effort to do the work to change things. So for example, if someone's overweight and they just had a like heart attack, part of what their doctor is going to ask them to do is to lose some weight. And they might also give them a pill. And people who are waking up, they will do what they need to lose the weight, but some people will just choose, choose to take the pill. And you have to understand that there's lots of factors that go into creating the problems that we have. So relying on medication to solve problems is not effective. And then prescribing people medications. So I would see people at the hospital who they lost their husband or their wife, they were in grief and they were prescribed medications. I did not agree with that. Grief does not get resolved with a medication. Mm. Emotional work, doing healing work, doing grief and loss work, that's going to heal you. You don't need a medication for that. So it's really tough, Todd, because it's a sensitive subject. But my personal opinion, and again, this is not a popular opinion. I don't think people are going to love this. But I personally believe that medications, although they can be life-saving, they can also be enslaving. Yeah. And there are people who are on 10, 14, 15 medications, and they're not happy. They're still not feeling they want to feel. And it's because the medication doesn't get to those core beliefs. The medication yeah. doesn't heal the pain after your husband left or your wife left. You know, medication might help your anxiety, but it doesn't get to the root of your anxiety. It doesn't help change it. So this is where I, I have a lot of feelings about it, as you can tell. <laughs> so. No, that's, that's, that's great. That's perfect. That's a perfect answer. So I know you have to go soon. So yeah. I want to wrap up. So how can people find you yeah. out there in the interwebs? Do you have a website and social media? Where, where can people get you? Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram. I'm Dr. Amber Rochelle on Instagram. I'm also Dr. Amber Rochelle on Facebook or just Amber Rochelle, my page. If you're interested in connecting with me deeper, potentially to see if working together would be a fit, um, there's going to be information that Todd posts, but there's uh, my, if you wanted to book a call, it's bookme.name backslash Dr. Amber. And that website will give you links to more information about me. And it's going to obviously also give you an opportunity to schedule a call if you want to do that. Great. So, thank yeah. you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank I you. Hope, I hope you come back. There's a whole lot more I would love to get into. I know. I, I could, we could talk for hours. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. You have a good day, okay? You too. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There you have it, my interview with Dr. Amber Salvador. You will definitely get to hear from Amber again. We had so much more we didn't get a chance to get into. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. See you next week on Quest. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. 
Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening.